here it is. Uh, deed, who really owns your home? Over 700,000 or is that 70 million? 70 million. That's 70 million titles. I can read that. It's so big. To property or clouded is yours one of them? This book could help you find out and fix it. In fact, I use information similar to this book to make sure with my house that I had that. And it goes on uh, to break it all down. Clouded titles, a new updated edition with case um, studies and sites. And Dave Krieger is our guest. It's available at InfoWarsShop.com, as I was saying. Invaluable book to have. Okay, Dave, this is a short segment, long segment coming up. Break down how the scam worked, what happened, what mirrors is, and then let's get into the usual suspect. I mean, it seems like everything, the attorney general's involved in it, even back during Clinton with his law firm, when he was deputy attorney general, getting all this changed. Where this is going, and let's get into the patriot mythology, getting a lot of people in trouble versus real stuff that's in your book. Uh, and uh, then let's take phone calls. Sure. Well, Alex, the, the thing started in 1995. It was a concept of how can we uh, basically control and track and transfer these mortgage notes on Wall Street. And so Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Mortgage Bankers Association, American Land Title Association, and all the major banks got together and came up with a game plan. And they got Covington and Burling, a law firm in Washington, D.C., to issue an opinion letter. And basically what it did was it gave what we call Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems, or MERS, credence to do what it's doing in America. And what, in essence, happens is that when you go to the closing table and you sign this piece of paper, which represents a mortgage or deed of trust, there's an 18-digit MIN number or MERS identification number that is the property of MERS Corp Holdings, Inc. that appears near the document title. And the things that we've been trying to do is to get people to recognize this, which is one of the fundamental reasons I wrote the book, because, you know, if you knew what the consequences were of getting a MERS loan or MERS mortgage, uh, MERS doesn't have anything to do with the actual mortgage note itself. MERS actually only is a, is a computer database that, for all intents and purposes, tracks the sales of these repetitively as they occur on Wall Street between the parties. The unfortunate thing about MERS, which it admits, by the way, is that it is not a substitute for the land records. All it is is an electronic database that is used by its membership subscribers, which is kind of like the credit bureaus. If you ever wonder who inputs the data on the credit reports, well, this is all these member subscribers of the credit bureaus that have access to this information. And the credit bureau is entrusted through the Fair Credit Reporting Act to uh, basically keep track and make sure that everything that's being reported is accurate, which is why we have the dispute process. Um, you know, to look at just the opposite, MERS does not have this kind of government regulation, as do the banks. Uh, they, you know, the so it's not a real deed registration. They they created it so they could run these scams and sell the deeds over and over again. Well, they sell the mortgage notes over and over again. Exactly. So how many times? Exactly. But I mean, it's the same. I mean, the same thing in the final equation, though, isn't it? Well, actually, no, your, your mortgage note, it, it was really sad to hear that. And, and I mean, I know they're two different things, but they come back to court and try to take your house with it. Exactly. Well, they try to come with part of the equation, not all of it. And this is one of the things that the attorneys who are studying this stuff and they're sharing this information with me are telling me is that they're trying to get the entire equation put together and do it in such a way that the judge will believe it. Because right now... So they're engaged in perjury and fraud but, and constructive fraud. But the issue here is that... For years now, they're getting their clocks clean in courts all over the place. And that's what you break down in your book. A lot of them have been. We've had a few significant cases where the homeowners have won. And we just had a, a RICO-style action happen down in, um, in, in uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida. We have an appellate attorney down there in Englewood that actually won a case at uh, Elizabeth Corson. And, uh, you know, it's been circulating around the Internet. And I'm sure if you type in Corson, uh, C-O-U-R-S-E-N, you'll see that case. We actually um, defeated a motion to dismiss there on the appellate level. Basically, we reversed it. Um, so, you know, we're, we're having a few victories, and then, of course, we have some of the sad consequences of what happens to people when they go in and they try and fight this thing on their own, and they file documents in the land records that are not appropriate. And as I was sharing with you before we went on the air, Alex, this woman in California filed uh, a document in the land records in an attempt to stop a foreclosure of her parents' home. And now she was convicted of two felony counts and sentenced to a year in jail. Yeah, stay there. We're going to come back and break that down because there are people out there on the Internet that will tell you to do stuff like this. This is the power of common law. You're filing and swearing to something, 
And let me tell you, it's fraud if it's not true. Now, the banks are doing it. But just because they're engaged in fraud doesn't mean we now run to beat them and engage in fraud. I mean, I mean, I mean there are procedures to sue banks when they've lied. Or isn't it where they violated the paperwork and violated your rights at the original time of signing? I mean, there's a lot of ways to go after them. Well, you know, we, we've seen attorneys do non-disclosure suits because nobody was told that MERS was there at the time and what they were for. People went in and they were so interested in getting the keys, they just signed their life away. You literally could have put in there, a uh, borrower agrees to give us his firstborn one year after this loan, uh, you know, is in force and effect. And they would just sign. And a fraudulent contract is null and void. Well, yeah, but they don't read it. And that's the problem. People do not read and understand what they're signing. They go to the closing table. They want the keys. You know, they've, they've tried like the Dickens to get a loan mod. And why would you do a loan modification with a bank that doesn't even own your note? That's another big problem we're having. But do you Okay, well, just give us a smattering. Because I've had a bunch of these lawyers on before. A smattering of things that are winning in court. Things that are, th things. To, I mean, obviously, it's all in the book. But things to look for. Well, if you see documents documents filed in the land records and and we see most of the problems having to do with assignments this is a big problem because when when they finally do come out of the closet these these people on wall street that are playing in the derivatives markets and they record a document in the land records generally we're seeing that it's five or six years past the, the actual date the note should have been conveyed into the pool and this is a big problem and the big arguments that are are being won now is arguments having to do with whether or not this falls under uniform commercial code at section three or whether it falls under sections eight and nine because sections eight and nine basically for those unlearned have to do with non-negotiable instruments and so when I look at these situations and I see that a note has been taken out of the realm of an article three UCC and put into Article 9 and it's been pandered on Wall Street and sold and resold and the borrower has no idea, then that in of itself sure. creates issues that attorneys are... Sure. Making. Also, they're successful, but I mean, I know you all, you know all the finer details, but uh, elaborate on this point and then the others that you're about to cover. Um, what about where they have lawyers for the banks come in and lie and say that they have all the proof and chain of custody and ownership and all of this and they're not? I mean, can't you also get them on that? There have been movements in the states now, specifically uh, New York and Nevada. Nevada came out with AB, Assembly Bill 284, which basically says that if you file phony documents in a court case in that state, and it can be shown that these documents are not legitimate, that the attorney could be disbarred and be facing jail time. It's a felony. Uh, but wasn't that already on the books? It, it was just. It's like saying pass laws. Last, yeah, last year. But, but it's like saying pass a law in Texas, the TSA can't grab your genitals. There's already laws that you can't do that. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's there's got to be laws in all the states. I've seen some of them uh, where where you get in trouble for filing false documents. Well, yes, fraud. There are perjury. Claims. Yeah, we have qui tam actions that have been filed all over the country, uh, specifically uh, in in California. Can't and, uh, somebody do that? Who's not even a party? That's what that is, right? Well, yeah, the qui tam basically is a whistleblower action, and no. they basically go out and say, okay, I'm I'm the um, I declare that I have information, and based on that information, uh, I'm filing a suit that all of these things are false claims. Those in of themselves are legal, but the attorneys I'm talking to that filed these claims years ago are now running into problems with them. Uh, and it all falls back on UCC Article 9 as to whether or not these are negotiable instruments under three or non-negotiable instruments. What, what, most of the victories against the bankers, where is it successful? Agency. The, the thing we're seeing now is if you can defeat and you can split or separate the relationship between the entities that are filing these documents and the entities that claim to hold the note, if you can split these things, in other words, when the trusts themselves come back in, and if you look in your assignment and you see an assignment that says this note has been assigned to, and there's some gobbledygook all the way through, you know, formerly uh, known as successor by merger two as trustee four. And then you see a number like 2007-HE5 or anything like that, a combination of numbers. You probably are dealing with a trust that has a pooling and servicing agreement. And this is what these attorneys like Mark Dan, the former Ohio AG, who's winning a lot of cases in Ohio. And he's going in and he's dissecting the pooling and servicing agreement and running it into court. And the judges, even though they're not... Uh, focused on securitization per se, New York trust law has a foundation in this in these securitizations. Well, I mean, the system has to write this, or it will destroy confidence in everything. Exactly, and and people are starting to get a little disgusted with it, especially when they find out stuff. A like little that. disgusted. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what yeah. I'm saying right now. We have to we have to use a logical head, Alex. We can't go out and do some of the stuff that's going to get you thrown in jail.
We've got to be reasonable with this, and we've got to take this thing. Um, and, and there is a methodology to this, a method to the madness. Now, now, what about? And we're going to go to break and come back and take calls. What about the system countering? I know they're trying to get some state laws passed to say mirrors is okay. I know they're trying to get the feds to have an agreement with attorney generals. I know that they're trying to kind of cobble over and paper over this. How is the system countering this? How are they trying to keep the scam going? Well, the bigger picture is there, the lack of prosecution. That in of itself, when you don't put the bad boys in jail, the process, the, you know, the, the, the dirty work keeps going on. So, you know, we, we come back to the, what we discussed first about Lanny and Eric and all the boys at the DOJ who used to be, uh, you know, basically partners with Covington and Burling, this law firm in D.C. that wrote the opinion letter for MERS. When you look at the bigger picture and you look at this 27 page white paper that was just released by Government Accountability Institute, they actually footnote all of the little causes of action that coulda, shoulda, woulda, but never happened because of the relationship between the DOJ, the SEC, and coming But now, isn't that just the moral authority of the public waking up and juries and things that are involved and the fact that? that now it's almost like a public tort warning that now they've been told stop doing this. Does that add any weight to stop them? It, it does in certain jurisdictions. We notice that like New York, for example, a lot of the judges in the five boroughs like uh, Arthur Shack, they won't put up with this stuff and they know robo signing when they see it. Uh, I virtually, if, if Arthur Shack would come to work for me, he'd probably be one of the best fraud spotters in the country. Uh, Again, we go to robo signing. That's exactly. been that's been ruled. It's, a, it's still going on. It's been ruled a fraud. It's still going and Obama's on. using a robot to sign now. He has a, uh, as a matter of fact, a robo signer on his deed. Uh, you know his mortgage in Illinois. He but he's he signing bills signed. with a robot now too. He probably has a signing machine. A lot of them do, and and they're using signing machines to sign the robo signing. Well, no, he'll be in Hawaii and just say sign that bill. That he shouldn't be able to do that. Well, if it's not in front of a notary, go figure, because notaries require the president. Yeah, it's all, it, you know. look, I know what's going on here. <laughs> sure the globalists are clouding all this so they can bring in a new system later they control and just go cashless and get rid of the old county deed systems. I'm telling you, they, they screw things up, tie all their fraud to everything, make it too big to fail, hold us hostage, and then roll out more tyranny as the solution. They would like to put us on a national registry, but I think the states aren't buying it. That's the one thing, you know, remember, thank God for the founders. It's right. the separation of powers. Exactly. And this is a problem when you're dealing with uh, issues where the county land records have been there since time began in this country. And now you have an electronic data. It's one of the few things that works great in government because it's ancient. Exactly. It's been, it's been figured out. Exactly. And, and so when you have a system that comes in and is totally, runs totally uh, juxtaposed to what we know to be true and factual. Yeah, we'll take our thousand-year-old system. We don't want your little fancy-dandy foreign banker, flim-flam, you know, Bernie Madoff, Ken Lash, El Scamo system. Okay, uh, we're taking your phone calls here, talking about the giant fraud. And before you leave, as you started getting into it, but we never got into it. Before you leave, get into the Justice Department and our loving Attorney General, because he's got a he's a big part of this. Well, it, being a good fellow yeah. from Chicago, we're going to get to it. I, I understand. Well, you know, basically, the word that's out on the street now through some of the reports that we're seeing, and and we review these things on a daily basis. Uh, we're, we're looking at uh, issues between the DOJ and Covington and Burling, uh, namely that. The uh, Eric Holder, Lanny Brewer were employees or partners, if you will, of Covington and Burling, which issued the opinion letter for MERS and MERS Corp. So when you have the DOJ tied to the entity that the banks basically use to transfer all their, um, their notes on Wall Street and play in the derivatives markets, you have some real issues. Well, no, that's the word. I mean, you, of interest. you get the select groups, the law firms, the accounting firms. Arthur Anderson, and then you can do whatever you want. People ask, well, how can Mitt Romney not pay ta hardly any taxes? Well, he's part of the special club, and, 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 and that's how the payoffs work. Let's go to some phone calls. Jim in West Virginia, you're on the air with our guest. Welcome, sir. Go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, two things utterly amaze me at their insanity. You can make every payment, but you never get the wet copy after you make all the payments of the notes. So it still isn't yours. And the banks collect and or foreclose based on a worthless copy of the original valuable note. Now, judges know the difference between a note and its copy. The copy is a forgery for crying out loud, just like there's a difference between a Federal Reserve note and a Xerox copy of, of the currency. Can you comment on this criminal insanity on the part of the judges? And I'll just listen. Well, the uh, the biggest part of the problem that we're we're seeing now is, you know, when people bring stuff into court, they're 
you know, the judges basically buy what evidence has been presented that hasn't been objected to. The bigger problem we're running into is a lot of people that go in there that get out procedured by the banks. And I think this is where the largest part of what we're seeing is the problem. Uh, you know, not that, you know, pro se litigation hasn't won. We had a case, uh, Reed versus Fannie Mae in California that just came out where she got a summary judgment. But, um, but to be clear, if no one objects, they could go in there basically with the back of a Cracker Jack box bring anything and say, want. here's my proof. Yep, bring anything they want. And the, and the court will accept it as long as you don't object to it. This is the general game plan. And a, lot, and a lot of people do not understand when they go into court that you can literally get out procedured because these people have a specific game plan. We have networks across the country of foreclosure mills that all band together and share information in a big <coughs> way. And I talk about that in the book. Um, and, and so when you, when you see all of this- It's called organized crime. Well, you call it what you want, but the fact of the matter is, is it's network sharing. And this is what we're trying to do on our end, is we're coming back and we have a network of about 40 attorneys that have all banded together and share information. And this network is growing. And it's, it, there are significant players in this thing that are actually winning cases. Now, like you said, former attorney generals of states and people like that. Thank you so much, caller. Uh, we're going to go to break and come back with more as we got to go to break. There's not time to get to a caller right now. But Truth Warrior, Mike, Mike, and Nathan, and others, we're going to be talking to you. Toll free number to join us, 800 259 9231. I'm Alex Jones, and you're listening to the GCN Radio Network, GCNlive.com. Uh, let's talk to Mike in New Mexico. Mike, you're on the air. Welcome. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. Hey, I got a question for you. Um, I don't know about these reverse mortgages. I, I'm, hear, I'm hearing them air a lot on uh, commercials, uh, and uh, it looks like you're ta attacking a lot of senior citizens. So uh, if you guys can elaborate on that, something to look out for your mom or whatever. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, they're telling old folks, live in your house till you die, but get some money to live now. Uh, on the house, um, in a way, maybe that's a good idea because the IRS will try to steal old people's houses unless it's all clouded, but I, I'm not giving advice. Uh, I, I mean, I'm sure that's probably pretty predatory. What's going on? Well, reverse mortgages, and we, we had a question on that uh, some on another program that I was on, and the woman basically was concerned about the fact, as you, say, as you stated, Alex, that uh, she was wondering whether or not this was a smart move for somebody that's getting up in years. And normally, when I think of people going into retirement, I'm thinking of people that are trying to literally pay off their mortgage and find a passive income stream. But because of the fact that America's financial education, well, you obviously didn't learn it in high school, you actually have to, instead of the school of... Um, uh, you know, uh, of high school, you learn it in Fort Knox or, or Hard Knox, uh, so to speak. Uh, you basically learn because you've sacrificed your almighty dollars and have gotten nothing in return. The, the bigger problem we're having is that the lack of education, lack of financial education in this country has basically allowed the lending community to prey on the interest of these people. And so they get these famous movie stars on that look trusting and they recommend these things and recommend these. So you're saying it's a bad idea. Uh, if it was my situation, I was facing retirement. I sure would be looking at another income stream. I could think of a lot of other things to invest. Sure. In. But let's say, let's more. say your cancer's in remission. You think you're going to be dead in five years. Do the re you know, reverse mortgage, go to the Caribbean and have a good time. Part of the problem is though, your estate starts to diminish and pretty soon by the time all this is said and done, you're, you're your state is left with nothing. I mean, that's that's the. But I mean, yeah. If you don't want to give your kids the money, though, blow it. I mean, it sounds bad. I'm not saying reverse mortgages are good. I don't know much about them. I'm just saying, are they always bad in your view? I generally tend to shy away from them, but you know, people have the reasons for for doing it, and I always tell them, look. If you're going to do a reverse mortgage, the best thing to do is consult with a financial professional. Get your, your Well, yeah, why not your, your sell the nicer house, house and move into a smaller apartment in a retirement community instead of getting the reverse mortgage? My mom did that very thing. She did the very same thing. She took her um, all the money that she had. She sold her house. And, of course, you know, her being in Florida, she took a nosedive on that house and lost $100,000 when she sold it. And so she took that money and put it into annuities and what she considered safe investments and left it there. And so then she moved into an apartment. And that way, you know, when it's time uh, to settle the estate, everything is very easy and not complicated. Now, the average person could have said, you know, the reverse mortgage sounds good because I want to leave something to my kids. Well, 
the downside of the reverse mortgage is the fact that it depletes the estate. So if the intent was to leave them something, well, don't you think it would be better just to try to figure out a way to create an income stream to pay off the mortgage or figure out a way to, um, you know, rent the house out and move into an apartment so somebody else can pay that mortgage? Because that's what a lot of people do when they can't afford the house. They rent it to somebody else and somebody else makes the mortgage payment. And then they move into an apartment, which is cheaper, that they can live on and they're fixing. All it. right, great analysis. Uh, I think that answered his question. We're going to go to break. Uh, two more segments. The next one's long. We're going to go to Mike, Nathan, Sandy, Truth Warrior. Actually, Truth Warrior is right after Mike when we come back. Again, I'm Alex Jones. Our guest is Dave Krieger. The book is Clouded Titles. It is amazing. What if you were not able legally to sell your home? Over 70 million American homes may be affected this book breaks it down. Available at InfoWarsShop.com. Uh, if you just tuned in, there is a mega fraud. I've talked about it a decade ago. People thought it was a conspiracy theory. How they didn't have the real... Uh, notes, they were engaged in fraud, they were selling into derivatives, uh, these mortgages over and over again, the chain of custody wasn't filed, the deeds weren't filed properly, uh, none of it was being carried out correctly. Well, now, you know, the last three or four years, that's been big news. It's continuing. And they're not just taking people who get behind on their mortgage. You know, you pay 24 years, you get behind, one month, they take it the last year. They're taking houses that are paid for. And we've gone over a lot of examples of that. And, or, or people think their house is paid off, but somebody bought it down the you know, line and just comes and says it's mine. And the courts take it, unless you know what you're doing. That's where the book Clouded Titles that we do sell at InfoWarsShop.com, massively discounted. Uh, it's uh, normally $49.95. It's $39.95, and you get a free citizen roll book uh, and bumper stickers with it. But the point is it's well worth it uh, and because it breaks down what real lawyers and others are doing to win and it's the latest, this just came out, this latest edition. Okay, uh, I wanna go back to the phone calls here. Let's go to Mike and then Truth Warrior and others. Mike in Wyoming, you're on the air with Dave Krieger, go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, uh, Dave, uh, there's another 500 pound gorilla out there that's clouding title, that's the IRS. I was in a urinating contest with him for many years and I, I finally had to go through bankruptcy to get him off my back, but I. I'm still saddled with a, a, a big uh, lien on my house that uh, my bankruptcy attorney says I'm just I'm stuck with it. There's nothing they can nothing they can do about it. But what the IRS does is uh, that they don't go through the normal procedure that's that anyone else would have to go through to file a lien with the county recorder. The recorder just says, "Well, I, we just file anything as long as the the appropriate fee is paid." They, they, there's no certification uh, to be specific. Is that even a mechanics lien? No, it, it, they have to certify that the that, you know that the information in there is, is accurate, and they don't do that. It's it's robo signed by someone who doesn't even exist. Yeah, no, uh, I'm familiar with that. And by the way, this is the big scandal you saw, uh, uh, Dave. This big breaking news just had a caveat, and I'm going to get the article out soon. For three years, I've been talking to a senior IRS person, and then for over a year or another. But the last few months are like, listen, there's going to be a big thing. Uh, we're told to give people fake, uh, well, I mean, they're not fake, but they really are fake under wrong names, these tax IDs. Then they can then attach those to social security numbers that aren't even the same. And government, Texas Comptroller, others have released millions of them. Foreign governments are involved, you name it. It's shutting down the IRS, but it's worse. When the illegals do stuff in your name or whatever, the IRS, and there's this identity fraud involved, will come and still take your account or put liens on you, and they're told it doesn't matter, just use it to take their money. And the IRS is finally in a mutiny. You know, the biggest center in the country is here in Austin. They are finally just going, This we can't do this. Uh, and they're taking retirees, homes, you name it. I mean, it is. So, so this breaking news you see is really a whitewash is what I'm saying. Uh, but uh, what do you say to that, Mike? Well, uh, my question is, how isn't there a way? Uh, can I do a quiet title action? Uh, I couldn't get any attorney to to touch it uh, locally here. Is this yeah, how do you out? challenge the fact that it's a robo signed fraud? Well, you know, again, you're dealing UCC largely in part deals, from my understanding, in Article Nine, 
uh, which is basically possession is nine tenths of the law. And if they can go in and seize whatever's in your bank account, and that, I know that judging from what I've talked to attorneys about, Mike, on these on these issues, that they're telling me that you know certain bankruptcy debts are dischargeable. Uh, or IRS liens, rather, are dischargeable in bankruptcy if they're older than three years. Um, my CPA even confirmed that. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, once liens are there, um, there's, there are certain procedures that you need to find uh, a real estate attorney that understands yeah. that stuff that, that can go in. Yeah, there are leave. people that aren't cowards that are willing to go up against go, the IRS. There are attorneys that will go and, and challenge the existing liens on there, especially if a lien has been discharged in bankruptcy and it still is... You know, showing on your on your chain. So, what saved you? Your 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 homesteads saved you from their clutches. Well, it's the the uh, the, the, the bankruptcy itself uh, stops any uh, collection activity, but but that doesn't uh, that doesn't make the lien just. By go the away. way, Mike is a doctor, and he and he hadn't called in a few years. And it, it, you've been listening over a decade, haven't you, Mike? Oh yeah, yeah, since the early days. I recognize your voice. How you doing? Oh, not 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 too bad. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know the old saying that uh, a fish uh, rots from the head down. Uh, our administration here at, at uh, my little hospital seems to have the same infection that the that the feds have. That uh, they can just do pretty much whatever they want, and uh, this uh, this mentality seems to be uh, uh, permeating our entire society. Yeah, the more Americans go along to orders, the tyrants will gravitate to the positions. Thomas Jefferson said the tyranny, the level of tyranny you will live under is the exact point he will put up with. And and that's the bad prognosis, Doc, as you know. But I tell you, you've been listening, it's got to be 12, 13 years. Has it not all come true like we said? I mean, it's, it's we're just following the, the signpost right into hell here. I mean, it's it's we're, we're getting pretty close to the mouth of the furnace now. Yeah, well, like you, I've, I've known for a long time, what was going on? I just, uh, I'm old enough that I thought, well, this, you know, this is something that the next generation is going to have to deal with. And I, I, I never dreamed that, uh, you know, at uh, fast approaching 60 years of age, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to be the one who has to deal with it. Well, look out probably, because my IRS source said 70 plus percent of the audits and seizures are doing. They've been told target retirees, and they've changed the laws retroactively to now try to get your money and say, oh, you took 200000 out the last couple of years out of your retirement. Uh, there's penalties and interest. You owe us a million. And it's not even a law. It's just total criminality. Good to hear from you. Any other comments on that? I'm good there. Amazing info. Uh, let's talk to Nathan in Minnesota. You're on the air with our guest. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me on. I'm actually a friend of Dan Fights, who's been on your show before. Yeah, good guy. Here. I'm an attorney here in Minnesota. And I, I, I practice in the area of bankruptcy, and then I, I've studied this issue. I've had something, uh, some knowledge and exposure to this. Just a couple of things I wanted to say. Um, in Minnesota, the MERS has come and lobbied our legislature and just gotten a MERS statute that just says everything they do, have done is okay. And they also got a favorable decision on a certified question from the federal court to the Minnesota Supreme Court in the case of Jackson v. MERS that basically says, yeah, everything they do is fine. You can sever the note from the lien. Um, that said, I think people should be really careful about, you know, what attorneys they hire. We just had one here that got sanctioned for a lot of money and who was representing to people that he was going to be able to take care of these things. So be real careful and check into who you hire. And then the other thing I wanted to say that has to go with the IRS, you see the IRS picking on little people all the time. When these things were securitized and they put them in like these REMIC trusts, I've learned this, I've gone to continuing legal educations on this from real legitimate attorneys that have been in, involved in this, a lot of people from the South. Um, they put them in these REMIC trusts. It's my understanding from these attorneys that the nature of these trusts is such that you're not supposed to transfer these assets around once you've got them in these trusts. So essentially, it appears to be that there's massive tax fraud that has been perpetrated by these banks and maybe Goldman Sachs or whoever has been churning these things out. I actually got to talk to a uh, retired uh, partner in Goldman Sachs at a bar, kind of a friend of an uncle who basically he designed these things and he basically acknowledged to me off the record it's just a big fraud that they would have them that they would have them certified triple a and uh you know spin them off and uh so i think that there's massive you see our little you know our doctors you know that's not for middle class person but i see people truck drivers and stuff picked on by the irs a oh lot. no 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 they they, they admit they go after little people for no reason because they can't defend themselves i mean it is it is it not only is the irs robbing people folks you're robbing innocent people and destroying families your your mojo whatever you want to call it your karma your reap what you sow 
I wouldn't want to be you. And I'm not talking about people doing something to you. I'm talking about God. I mean, I've learned one thing, folks. You do wrong, it comes back on you many fold. Um, I noticed, uh, Dave, that you're sitting there pretty excited to say something you know about these cases. Thank you for the call, sir. Well, I, I have one question. I oh, stay there. Ask, stay yeah. there. Yeah, I have one question I want to ask Nathan if you're still in the He line. already dropped. Sorry. Dropped. Yeah. I, I'm trying to find out how much luck these bankruptcy attorneys are having doing adversarial proceedings inside of Chapter 13 because a lot of people, they try to do a Chapter 7 bankruptcy and, and you basically are just discharging and dumping all the debt. But you were you were nodding your head when you talked about a lawyer getting sanctioned in Minnesota. Uh, that was a massive case and he's still getting sanctioned. He basically was doing a lot of blanket filing of the same type of lawsuits trying to stop these foreclosures and the courts basically just hammered them. Unfortunately, the problem in Minnesota, uh, and this is, you know, there are several states that are really seriously in trouble. Michigan is one, Minnesota is one. They've given MERS a lot of latitude. Arizona, with the Cervantes case and the multi-district litigation, has given MERS a huge... So the courts are backing the fraud. A lot of what we're seeing is that the courts are siding with MERS in that the, and this is part of the problem is the borrower. The borrower went in ignorantly and signed his name to a deed of trust or mortgage and gave mercy. But a fraudulent, I'm no lawyer, but I know in, in all law, uh, ancient and, 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 and the more newer forms, a, 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 something designed to deceive and to be a fraud is a null and void contract. If it can be proven. The, the, the thing I have to ask the borrower when they go to the closing table like yourself, when you went out and got a mortgage loan, did you read before you signed? Yes, but it's written in legalese, you know, uh, basically in a foreign language. I understand. Did they tell you that you could get an attorney at the time that you signed this document? No. Yeah. See, the thing is, is that Americans, because of this lack of financial education I was referring to uh, earlier in the show, uh, because of the fact that they... No, we've been raised, and they we've been raised to be victims and to be cattle. That, that's why the big banking associations 100 years ago or more said we've got to finance the dumbing down. Yeah, well, you have to look at when you go in to sign a mortgage loan, if anything, if you know somebody that's going to be buying a house uh, at any point in time in the near future, you need to sit down. If you know about this book and you need to share it with them and tell them, look, if you go in and you see an 18 digit min number, it means that they intended to securitize your loan. That min number was on your document before you went to closing. They already had that note and that pool and everything. No, they already get it agreed to get you the loan. Now, now, to exp and they shop it around. That's how they get it. But to expand on that, you're saying more and more. You can go to title companies, others themselves. You can do an original, old-fashioned system. You just got to ask for it, right? There are good banks out there that will hold the paper, and that's the way it used to be. So, and, and the book breaks it all down. Clouded titles available right now at infowarshop.com or link through at infowars.com. Get it. So let's go to Sandy in Florida. You're on the air with the author of Clouded Titles, Dave Krieger. Go ahead. Hello, how are you? I'm good, ma'am. Do you have a question or comment? Kind of a question and a comment. Well, actually, I, I was helping a friend of mine who's been facing foreclosure. She's been fighting successfully through an attorney, but then they dropped her because the banks wanted to do a modification, and she didn't. So we went pro se because we couldn't find any attorneys to help us. One actually said, you know what happens when people come against the system? They get killed. So we went and we showed the judge that the assignment of mortgage was done two months after they had already first filed for foreclosure. So when she talked to the attorney, the attorney said, oh, that we took care of that before. And she said, no, there's nothing in here about that. And then she said, yeah, they originally said no. Finally, she looked at him and she goes, you got a serious problem here. And she says, but I'm not dismissing the case. And she looked at my friend, she goes, because I'm not going to give you a place for free. So they, you know, they stopped it. They didn't give them the uh, summary judgment. So listening to you, I've written some, down some notes. We did, she did get an attorney because when I said to, my friend said to the judge, we feel there's fraud involved in the actual. Sure, we're not going to be able to break down the whole case here today, ma'am, or give you, you know, things that are going to. When you need to get the book or do further research, but uh, do you have a question for our guest? Well, yeah, the question is that they want to do mediation. There is a there. Should we bring up? They're supposed to have a title expert. So if he's there, should we bring up the whole thing about 
what you were mentioning about the... Uh, well, ma'am, we can't sit here and give you advice over the air and know the particulars, but I appreciate your call, but I'm sure you hear this all day, Dave. I do a lot. And, you know, basically the way things are, if, if I was in that position, Alex, I would be, you know, looking at the attorney and I'd be saying, okay, uh, you know, what's wrong with the logistics here and why aren't we arguing these things? I mean, he, he needs to speak up. Uh, you know, my biggest concern, because she was sitting there talking about a loan mod, if, if you've got a document that or an assignment that is questionable, and you know it's questionable then you know the question then becomes or the issue becomes why am i negotiating and doing a loan mod with a lender that may not own my note this is this yeah but that shows you've already gotten pretty far that now they're trying to well see the problem with with loan mods is it drives the borrower because it takes a long time to get a loan mod done and the whole time that this is happening the borrower is either making trial payments or not making payments at all uh, and, and they're getting deeper in debt and there's more servicing fees being added on by the servicer. And so as an end result, it costs more to dig out of the of the snow drip, you know, once everything is all piled up around you. So, you know, this is why you, we go back to the core and look at chain of title versus chain of custody of the note. Exactly. They're trying to change the subject. Let's go to Bob in Florida. Bob, you're on the air. Hi, how you doing? Good. Hey, listen, uh, it's funny that you guys are bringing this up today. Uh, I had a piece of property that uh, was sold yesterday and I got a phone call from the title company and here the notary at the county level never had a witness when she notarized it. Now she's a county employee, never had it witnessed and here the title company will now or will not allow the uh, sale to go through and I was told I have to go get an attorney. Well, that's one of the good things now. They're starting to make them not do all the robo behavior. Go ahead. No, that that's a that's a valid argument and a valid reason to go get counsel because of the fact that you know somebody might be subtly uh, sending you a message that you might have an out here. You might be able to vacate the entire judgment and sale because of the fact of the way the case was done. And that's you know when you're seeing any little thing that's wrong, including not having a notary witness or any number of little factors that creep into this situation. Yeah, what's happening is you've got moral people who thought that the IRS and, and, and other places were legitimate. Now they're finding out it's all a fraud. And people at the county level, they're not allowed to come out and speak out against it because of the tyranny, but they will sit there and give you tips. They will you know, explain things to you. Well, they, drop, they can't give legal advice either, Alex, but they can drop subtle hints, and that's apparently what this gentleman has happened to him. And so if somebody says, I really think you need to get an attorney because I see a problem here, you know, they're basically speaking off the cuff to you, but what they're doing is they're dropping a subtle hint that you may have a case. Uh, and, you know, you always have to entertain that. You can't, you know, for you to sit there and do nothing diminishes your chances exponentially. If and the you, more of us, and the more of us fight them just by sheer numbers, it's going to, it's going to drive this out in the open. Great uh, call, sir. Does that answer your question?